We're thrilled to have a special guest with us in the studio today, Arlen Glick. Arlen Glick is is a, a Christian, an ultra marathon runner, and a good friend. And when we say ultra marathon, we're not just talking like 30 miles. We're talking 100 miles. His specialty is the 100 mile race. Yes, you heard that right. 100 miles miles um that he runs that's kind of his his specialty distance um in in running these ultra marathon races and winning them but not only does arlen run these incredibly intense distances but he's also the running the race of the christian life seeking to live sold out for christ and i've just been so encouraged as i've gotten to know arlen over the years and seeing his heart for the lord and his love for people has been a, a great encouragement to me and i'm just excited arlen to have you here in the studio and just to uh, be able to talk about um, a little bit of your testimony and then also kind of some of the amazing correlations between the christian life and distance running yeah well thanks so much gabriel for having me here today it's a privilege to be here and i'm excited about what we have to talk about so as we as we dig into things here, Arlen, I thought it'd be neat if you started out like obviously I, we you know you've been running these ultra marathons you know it, you you ran in, in in and took third place in Western states, which is like one of the most well known prestigious ultra marathons in the U S. and maybe in the world, um, and ran some other. You broke thirteen hours in another one of your hundred mile races. So you've run on a pretty competitive level. You're a professional athlete. Um, this is your full time career. But I guess before we get into some of that, I kind of wanted to start out with just. What were things like growing up? I mean, did you kind of go straight from, you know, being a little baby, you just skipped the crawling and went straight to running? Or was it, or, <laughs> or did, or have you always run your whole life? Or tell us a little bit about like what things were like growing up and your family, and then also kind of how you started getting into running. Yeah. So I grew up, I was one of nine children. Um, there were six boys and three girls. I was caught right in the middle. Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as running goes, I never, I never dreamed of doing it. Like I thought when I heard about the marathon, I thought that you know that was just like insane like these people were probably like 95 percent dead when they finished the line i was sh i was sure that was why it was 26.2 miles was because if it was 26.3 you would be dead so i was corrected on that later in life um and yeah at some point i took an interest in running just simply as a you know i'm getting older I was probably like late teens early 20s at the time and i'm like you know what it probably would be a good idea to like work some kind of exercise regimen into my life um you know when we look at the scriptures it said uh bodily exercise profiteth little but godliness profiteth unto all things you know it does acknowledge that it's it's sort of like common knowledge that bodily exercise does does profit okay a little bit so i kind of like wanted to because i didn't want to just like get old and unhealthy like so many people do so it was just like a curiosity thing and i was like okay running's probably the thing to do so i kind of started doing that and with that like found out that how much like joy and like how much it helped my my headspace and and just so many different ways in my life that it was like oh wow this is a blessing um and with that then became the curiosity of like wow this is like easier than it looks like i couldn't have Im imagined running like 10 miles before and now i do it like every week and so with that curiosity one thing went to the next and eventually i got into the competitive world like years into it um got into the competitive side of of doing it and now the last year and a half have been doing it professionally um which has opened up a lot of doors um both for travel and like exploring seeing the world and meeting a lot of people um so it's been it's been quite a gift um but it's it's something that like i can remember i think it was it was soon after i ran my first hundred mile race you know this was like my hobby up to this point and there was some time soon after that i remember listening to a message um from a guest speaker that came to our church and it was just like after that message i don't even remember what he preached about but it was after that message god just put a peace in my heart that this running thing that he was okay with that and that was from that cue then I always felt like okay at least God if God is okay with this if this is what he has for my life then I need to walk you know walk in that and I think because this wasn't like some big vision that I had growing up or like mm -hmm. something that I wanted to do it was more like I just simply had that small still small voice of God's approval in that area of my life and with that i think it was so helpful though you know through going through having a breakout you know going pro all of that through my life all those you know micro mm -hmm. steps that came along um i think it was so helpful for me to like constantly be reminded that this was just something that 
God gave me his approval on and not a big dream that I was chasing. Yes, which that's huge is that you were is is that it wasn't like you were getting your approval or your fulfillment or your acceptance from being an incredible runner, you were getting it from Christ first. Tell us a little bit like how did you come to know Christ? You grew up in a Christian home. Tell us a little bit about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I grew up in a in a, a Christian home. We were very heavily involved in ministry from a very young age. Um, we travel all across the America, you know, the, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, uh, sharing. We we've done a lot of prison ministry. Um, you know, working working in the in the in the prisons. Do it. We have a singing ministry. So I grew up in like a very active ministering home. But I can remember. I don't remember the exact day, but I remember when I was 11 years old. I realized that like, wow, we travel around to inmates, but and and share our faith with others. But I was like, you know what? This thing that I'm sharing with others, I'm not even walking in myself. And it was at that mm-hmm. moment that God convicted me. And I realized that, you know, I needed the same saving grace that I was trying to offer to others. Um, so, yeah, it's been a long, a long journey from that point. But, yeah, that's kind of where the race my, started, my, if you will, of the Christian life. <laughs> yeah, um, that's where the race started. Yeah, that's where you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus and, and, he, and, he, and he saved you and he started working in your life. And, and so then as you're, you know, you're, you're starting to, you know, you started out just kind of running to um, for exercise, you know, and you're traveling around doing ministry and um, just seeing God work. I, I've actually been in prison with you. Um, Arlen and I have been in and in a prison together, actually doing ministry together. And it's been a really special time. And it's just been an exciting time seeing God work in those different areas and places. And um, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, so, okay, so you're, you start running. Was your, like, were you like, okay, I'm just going to straight away run crazy distances, or did you kind of, like, work up to, you're like, okay, see, I, I like running, but I don't run on your level by any, in, in any way, um, but, I, but I, like, I would be like, okay, I think I'm going to run a few miles, and if that goes well, you know, then you keep adding to it, that kind of thing, or were you just like, I'm just going to go for the long distance? No, it, it was a very gradual thing, like, I, I think I ran my first marathon before I ever even knew that there were any humans on the planet that were running 100 miles. And how fast? Just give us an idea. How fast did you run that marathon? Um, so I, I kind of like abandoned the marathon uh, campaign here quite some years ago. Uh, but at the time when I quit running marathons, I, I ran like a two-hour, 40-minute marathon. Um, which is really fast. <laughs> which, is, which is really fast, but very far from being professional. So I definitely... When it comes to running economy, like they're like, I, I, I still think I probably have like the slowest marathon, fastest hundred mile time combination of, of any other athletes. Like I compete a lot of times with guys that have, you know, much faster marathon times than myself. Um, but it's just, you know, it, it comes down to like a lot more about running economy when you, when you throw different distances at, at the same athlete. And so then, and, and, and so then as you started running these longer distances and getting into some, you know, maybe 50 mile and then a hundred mile, like what you found was, is that your hundred mile was kind of your sweet spot. That was the distance that you really liked. Um, and was, how did you do on your first hundred mile? Um, I did well on my first hundred. And to answer your f- former question, it was a f- one step at a time curiosity thing. I can remember when I f- ran my first ultra marathon, you know, it was a 50 K and I was like, Oh boy, that's a long, that's a long ways further than a, a marathon. And then uh, a year later, I followed that up with my first 50 miler, which was a huge jump. That was like a 20 mile jump. And then it was a year after that, that I was like, I heard about this hundred mile thing. And I was like, my, my thoughts honestly were more like, I wonder what would happen to my body if I tried that. And so, yeah, I signed up for my first hundred miler and it was, it was a local one, just 10 minutes from our house. And yeah, it went very well. Like I, I ended up winning the race running like under 15 hours on like, your first hundred. Miles. Yeah. My first hundred miler. And so it kind of like blew my, my mind. I was like, I was thinking like 18 to 24 hours was like a really good time. And then I ran, ended up running like under 15 hours, like finished before dark that night. And I was like, whoa. So that was a, that was a big surprise, but it also was a big scare for me too, because I realized like I knew how bad it hurt to do that, like how much I suffered during that time. And I realized at that point I had this, like this very stark reality that I, I realized I'm good at something that hurts really bad. And it was like, there was a wrestling for about six months after that of, oh no, like if I want to be good, I'm going to have to be willing to suffer. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, many times as we walk with God, that's the way it is when we walk with him. Like if we want to be used by him, we're going to have to be willing to suffer. 
like we cannot be used unless we are willing to suffer for him yeah yeah was it maybe david livingston that said something to the effect of before god can use a man he breaks a man and it's so often through that suffering and those difficulties in the race of our christian life that we walk through that god uses those things to to shape us and to prepare us and to break us so that he can use us um in a mighty way and so that's such a powerful correlation and i appreciate how you brought out too earlier how as you started kind of going down this um, track of running in finding out that you're good at it being like okay i could actually maybe compete on a you know in, in this way but then also be feeling like it was more than just hey this is fun it was like you started since like maybe the lord's leading in this right and i just think of um eric little you know and obviously his running and how god used that and he's like the lord you know made me for his purpose but he also made me fast right and i feel his pleasure when i run was that kind of that famous statement of eric little's but i kind of seems like you're saying something kind of similar if you're like okay god designed you and built you to be able to run these long distances um, and it was a tool that he was going to use, and we're going to get into that more a little bit later. But tell us a little bit about, like, okay, so I just want to get in your head a little bit of what it's like to run 100 miles. So very, like, like I, I don't even know, think before I met you, I even knew that anybody could humanly run that far. And I'm guessing a lot of the listeners are going to be in the same place. We didn't even think that was possible. Now, I know ultra marathon running is becoming more of a thing now than what it used to be, but I think even so, I didn't know it was possible. Like, it's expanded my realm of even what I thought humanly could do, and I, I know you just recently ran an even further distance than that. Maybe we'll talk about that <laughs> later, but... But even just 100 miles seemed impossible. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned I do a little bit of running. and But, like, for me, it's like, you know, people talk about, okay, you run a marathon, which sounds like nothing when you think of 100 miles. But when I run a marathon, you know, there's different places you hit a wall. Like, I, I think a lot of people around 18 to 20 miles, you just hit, like, like kind of like a wall. And you just, oh, and it's just hard to overcome that. But I thought, on 100 miles, you must hit a wall that feels like, you know, I don't know, a massive wall. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit of, like, how, what's going through your mind when you're running that kind of distances? Yeah, so mindset is probably like definitely the key. Like that's the biggest thing. Um, it's so easy to like just like forget how bad you wanted it when you're actually hurting for so long. Like a lot of people go into it with this tough, tough head men mentality that I'm willing to suffer. And then they realize that they have to wait like eight hours till they actually start suffering. Um, and I think one of the biggest changes from, you mentioned the marathon distance, which is 26.2 and yeah, the wall, everybody talks about it. I don't know why they don't reroute the course so it doesn't hit the wall, but anyway, <laughs> right, right. but it, it become this, it's become this infamous distance of 18 to 20 miles. And it's actually very pr predictable. And I believe it's because it's when your body is like figuring out its nutrition, like it's very easy okay. to run for around two hours with just you know, the carbohydrates that your body is stores right. with you all the time. And I think it's, I think it's kind of the, that breaking point where your body has to like switch its nutrition around and figure out what's, what it's going to do to operate for more hours than that. Um, so once you get into like the, the hundred mile distance or like well beyond the marathon, it becomes so much more unpredictable, unpredictable. So the nutrition thing becomes a very, a very, like that's probably responsible for like half of the DNFs like did not finish. So like to put it in perspective, like almost everyone that sets out to run a marathon finishes it like probably 99 right. out of a hundred. But in the hundred mile distance, we find finish rates usually around 50%. So like 50% of these nutcases that went out and said, I'm going to go run a hundred miles. Like they got to eat crow for mm -hmm. lunch. Wow. So, okay. So, and it, obviously as you were, you know, you're sharing here that 50% don't finish, but then you said one of the main reasons is nutrition, right? And what I, or lack thereof, or, you know, uh, 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 imbalance in the nutrition and what they're eating and how they're intaking their calories and just the different things, because obviously your body's burning a tremendous amount of calories as you run. I couldn't help but thinking, even as we think of the correlation between the Christian life and, and, and running the race set for us as believers, you know, a huge part of running the race set before us and running well in our Christian life is actually nutrition. And what I mean by nutrition is it's like a daily diet of the word of God. You know, scripture says in Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found and I did eat them, right? And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing in my heart for I'm called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. And, and so just like you're running these long distances and you got to eat the right food as believers, if we're going to run the distance, we got to eat the right food, right? We need to be in the word of God every day. Um, and taking in, you know, it says this newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And spiritually speaking, if we're going to run the distance, we need to be in the word. Um, so anyways, little, little yeah. just th thought there of just the, the, the importance of that. Tell us a little bit. So as you're running, you know, these starting to run these hundred mile distances, 
how did you like how was it like because you, you won your first race was and then you you how were the races then following yeah so i the first one was a, not a competitive race um on a, a local or a national level um so i won that one it was an amazing time and everyone you know everyone that knew about it you know was like whoa that's a really good performance um but it really didn't stock up to much against you know the other competition in the area because it was like well he didn't he didn't race any of the good guys um so the following year i went to and i ran another local 100 miler which is st- to this day still my tr- favorite like training grounds I, I did i mention i grew up in ohio lived mm-hmm. lived in ohio my whole li- life other than the last year and a half that i've traveled all over the world but the you know when i it's like the mohican 100 was my second 100 miler and it's still like my favorite training grounds when i'm at home um it's a nice a, a, a beautiful park about an hour from where i live and so i ran that race and that one typically would bring out the best competition on the on the local on the local level and like within ohio like it definitely brings out the the best guys um so i ran that one and like there were like predictions of who was going to win and who was going to get third and who you know every and like they completely forgot about me like they didn't even know who i was at the time and i come out and i ended up winning that race and it was a really big boost to my confidence that wow like i stepped up my game and i and i won again um and i followed that up with like quite a few other wins on more of like a local level i stepped into uh, some slightly more competitive races um but then kind of when things shifted was in 2021 i went after taking like quite a few wins at the at the distance but not necessarily on like a national level um but then i went out to the Havilene 100 in 2021 and which is like the golden ticket race for the western states 100 which like that's kind of like the 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 grand finals of of the ultra running events is like the western stage 100 which is actually taking place tomorrow out in california um so it's like a very coveted race to get into like there's like thousands of people that are putting in the lottery every year um and they only give 369 spots away um so it's a very prestigious event extremely hard to gain entry um but if you win one of these golden ticket races you get direct entry into it so in 2021 i went to arizona to compete at the javelina 100 and ended up you know fortunately i ended up winning that race um which got me a spot into the western states 100 and i came back in 2022 and that's when i you know got a podium position there and um unknowing unknowing to me i was wearing a a craft t-shirt craft sportswear and uh the craft athlete manager was at the finish line when i finished and never said a word to me or anything but he kind of had his eye on me and he's like wow this guy's an unsigned athlete and like to make it into the top 10 at western states as a as a unsponsored runner is unheard like almost unheard of yeah and so like then you know months later they approached me and were like hey we would like to sponsor you and that's where it turned into a professional career um, but that was kind of like the progression. Like mm-hmm. you kind of have to step onto the national or international scene um, at some point if you want to like make a make a career out of it, um, which worked out quite well for me. Um, but yeah, it was it was a lot of there was a lot of steps along the way where like of like building confidence, building trust, you know, trusting the process because like the the feeling of like your legs just like feeling like sand when you're standing at the start line and you know what the day is gonna is gonna hand you it's just like yeah sometimes it's just like what you know what did i get myself in for i still get that like i know this is gonna hurt i know it's gonna throw me everything i didn't think about you know didn't prepare for um but you just have to like trust the process and like figure it out as you go and so and i i appreciate you bringing us into kind of that feeling of the start line you know and you know what you, you know but you don't know what's in front of you um and you know even as you ran western states um just so people get a kind of a little bit of a picture of this this isn't a running flat on a smooth road you know um kind of thing like like the, it's intense elevation like you're running through just describe a little bit of the train because this is the western states would be like if you run marathons everybody's heard of the boston marathon if you run at marathons at all because it's like the premier i would imagine this would be kind of the equivalent right of the boston marathon in the ultra marathon running world at least in being known yes what's the what's it like explain the explain just a little bit so people get a sense of this isn't just like 100 miles on flat roads 
Yeah, well, I think you probably need a little bit of history in ultramarathoning. So we, the Western States 100 is a 100-mile race from all from Olympic Valley, California, to Auburn, California. It's it's a very famous trail, um, and it started out as a horse race. People would race their horses, and you know, legends have it. You know, the story tells it. I think there this, this will be the 52nd running of the Western States 100 since it became a foot race. Uh, or a, a man race. Um, so it started out as a horse race, and one of the participants that had competed in it, um, he his horse came up lame. He didn't have a horse, and so he did, decided to try it on foot. And so that is when, like, eventually they, they got rid of the horses. Like, they were like, let's turn this into a human race. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're going on 52 years of of doing this event but it's extremely difficult like there's 18,000 feet of vertical climbing and then 22,000 feet of elevation loss throughout the the 100 miles it's you know through through the mountains it's like average uh high temperatures are between like 80 and 105 um so it's going to yeah extremely hot um and and a lot of a lot of up and down which <laughs> just running 100 miles by itself is enough but then you add all those components on top of it and this is an incredibly intense race and then of course you being a guy from ohio running you know more on lower elevation now you're having to run at elevation and there was just a lot of um it, it, it was an intense race but then you you ran you took you took third which is a podium finish um and now at this point you've been running on a pretty competitive level you've won a few key races prior to this but you hadn't had a sponsor pick you up, and part of that was because of a decision you made related to social media. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I know. I know this is this is a hot topic, um, but for me, I felt like early on when when the whole social media thing come around, and that was kind of the the doorway to professional ultra marathoning because like we don't have a team that represents us. We have to like you know, market ourselves, if, 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 if you know what I mean. And I felt like God prompted me early on that, like, Arlen, if you do that, you're going to be a fake. Hmm. Like, you can't be, like, that's not who you are, hmm. is to, like, is, is to do that, to go out and put yourself out on social media. And so, for me, I was like, well, okay, like, I don't have social media. Like, that's, that's no big deal. Like, I can, I can give that up. And then when I got you know, further and further into this and, and people started saying, Arlen, you know, you're like running way better than professional athletes. Like, you know, you know, you're on that level. Right. And then, and then they would remind me, you like, you know, it's not going to work if you don't have social media. Mm -hmm. Like they kept reminding me that like, you have to have social media if you want to do this. But I remembered like thinking to myself and, and just like feeling God's promptings that I would rather do it God's way or mm -hmm. my way, the way that you know, be off my authentic self and not be sponsored or, or this, you know, may appear to be mm -hmm. unsuccessful than to like buckle to something that, you know, I didn't feel was right, but then, you know, maybe make money doing it because, you know, at the, we all have jobs, right? We all, we all have right. to, we all have to put, pay the bills. Um, and so I think, I think social media, the, 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 the touchy thing is like, Social media, what it what it does so often is it like sucks people into the comparing game. Mm -hmm. Like you just you can't help but 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 look at how many followers do they have, or if you're good taking your if you're going to a brand to sell yourself to a brand, you that's that's the number one thing is like, well, how many followers do you have on Instagram, or, or you know, what how how much how much of a presence do you have out there? And while that may be okay for some, you know, maybe mm -hmm. some people can 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 sort that out for for so many people it becomes a thing where that they realize in order to make money they have to be popular they have to look good they have to they have to be good at this social media thing and what it what it does is it separates and it makes a point where like you don't have the best athletes getting getting the best contracts because mm -hmm. you have people that are maybe not that great of an athlete, but they're really good at social media content. <laughs> right. And so, and that's very successful. So they have a lot of followers and you know, that, that'll sell to a brand. But what, what's dangerous about that is then it sucks other people into living a fake life because they want to, you know, look good. They want to, they want to make it look like they're having fun, make people jealous. They want, mm -hmm. and so 
it's not that social media is such a bad thing. It's mm-hmm. just what it can suck you into. Um, it's mm-hmm. just a very dangerous place to put yourself. Um, so I decided mm-hmm. for me, it's like if a brand wants me, they, they, they have to want me for who I am, not mm-hmm. for what they want me mm-hmm. to be. And that's so good because I feel like one of the things that you're sharing there that's so powerful is it was like you felt like there were two ways that you could do this. You could do it the way that man said you had to do it if you wanted to get sponsored, but you felt like for you personally that God was leading you not to do it that way. And so it's like you had a choice there where you're going to choose God's way or you're going to choose man's way. Um, and I think even of um, just the testimony of George Mueller and who had a, a orphanage who provided orphan this, who lived many years ago and he had orphanages and he just. Um, basically ran them by faith. He just trusted God to provide, never asked anyone for money. Um, that was one of the things that, because he felt like that was what God would have him do. And so he just trusted the Lord with it. You know, wasn't sending out support letters, wasn't, t- I mean, he just, just trusted God and God provided in a mighty way. Um, and kind of even in a, what you were talking about of just where it was like, you felt like this is the way that God was leading you to take. And the amazing thing is without social media, God still provided a sponsor, right? And so it was neat how God worked in that situation. But I guess just the importance of walking with the Lord and being sensitive to the prompting of his spirit and being willing to do what he's leading, even if it goes counter culture, even if it goes counter what other people would say is the way to do it, you know, or whatever. Um, Just the importance of us as believers doing it God's way and seeking his face um, and relying on him. Um, And so I just appreciate you sharing just as you took that that stand what God was leading to. Like you said, nothing, there's nothing wrong with social media in and of itself. But there can be the tendency to want to start comparing myself, and there can be the tendency to um, sometimes put an image on social media that isn't actually who the person really is. Um, and so it's like I appreciate just the um, what you're bringing out here of just the importance of whether we're on social media or not, we need to walk authentically with the Lord and live that before men and before him and in every way walk with him. <laughs> um, and, and that kind of brings me into another aspect of this is we think about walking authentically before the Lord. You know, one of the things, you know, obviously, you know, as you mentioned, you know, when you finished there at Western States, you did have um, someone from Kraft was there and they ended up a number of months later picking you up and starting to sponsor you. So now you're doing this professionally. Um, you mentioned kind of being able to travel around the world now, some, you know, in, 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 in um, related to different things related to running. And, you know, this podcast centers on the commands of Christ. And one of the commands that we um, covered quite a while back was one let your light shine um, and listeners could go back and listen to those episodes to hear that unpacked more but it comes there from Jesus' words in Matthew 5 where he talks about let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven obviously through giving you a, a, a platform as a professional athlete he also opened up a door for you to be able to share the Lord with people and then to see the light of Christ through your life share with us some of kind of how that's looked um, like what are some opportunities God's opened up as God's placed you in this position of being um, a professional athlete. Yeah, and that's the that's the part I think you have to just walk in God's calling, okay? And you don't you don't many times it's like, you know, I could have been like, well, God, why you know why did you how are you going to use this? Like it made no sense. Like how how is God going to use this? Um, but after walking in his in his calling for for quite some time. Um, I would start getting, you know, invitations to come and speak at events. And I was amazed so many times, like, by the people that invited me, mm-hmm. like, not believers. But they would invite me to come speak at an event. And they would even go out of their way and say, Arlen, if you want to share about your faith, like, that's what people like about, like, that's what people want to hear about. Mm-hmm. And so here they are, not even believers, but yet asking me to share about my faith and, like, giving me the platform to do that. And it was it was so so powerful in some some situations because like I can remember one event a local race that I was asked to go and speak at the day before the event took place and I had broke the chorus record the year before so like the you know my fame was like kind of like buzzing right then and I went I went and I spoke at the event and then I later found out that like one of the legends of the past had just passed away. Of, of like one of the best of his era had just passed away and like left an impression on people but the things that I said at the event that I thought was completely irrelevant to this situation I later found out was exactly what people needed to hear because like I had shared that like many times running just becomes like a mental health thing that people use you know use mm-hmm. running to help them get through life and while I'm you know very much an advocate for our sport and I think it is very helpful 
but it is no replacement for God in our lives. Like if we try to fill the God-shaped void with running, it is not going to fit because I see it so often like people that overcome drug addictions or alcoholism or something with running. And they always tell me like, Arlen, I got my life back. Like running got my, and, and I know that that's not true because if you're, if they got it back through running, they didn't fill the void that, that, you know, God placed us with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was interesting as I was sharing at this event about just the importance, like they knew ever the audience, I didn't realize this, but the audience knew that this legend who had just passed away, like running had got him out of addiction, but he got injured later in his career. And then like his, his, his life just fell apart. He got divorced. He was just went back into alcoholism wow. and it was like running filled the void until running couldn't, mm -hmm. you know, all it was, he was just an, an injury away from catastrophe mm -hmm. because he was filling that with something, you know, God created running, like mm -hmm. running is, you know, about the only exercise that's actually mentioned in scripture. <laughs> um, and mm -hmm. so like, it's obviously a, a gift from God, but when using out of place, it just becomes a replacement for God. And so it's, it's, it's nice. Like God, when God gives you a platform to speak on, he also like gives you the respect of the people to hear it. Mm -hmm. And like, I think, I think that's when, when you have someone who is successful at, at, you know, a certain event, athletic performance you you may have respect maybe not outside of that realm but you do have respect in that realm mm -hmm. and it's very important that you just bear the truth wherever wherever god has given you that influence if there are people willing to listen mm -hmm. then that's where god has called you and you just have to be faithful with whatever it is that god calls you and because we, we're all in full-time ministry mm -hmm. right whether right. we work a full-time job or whether we you know run around the world um right anyway <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's so good, and I and I I think that that's such a, a profound point. Even as we're considering the importance of of letting your light shine before men, and really um, allowing the light of Christ to be seen in and through us, is that the the I think part of the point here is it's like wherever we're placed, like you said, being faithful and walking with Christ and allowing Him to use us, whether it's running in ultra marathons or whether it's plumbing or whether it's construction or whether it's what we would typically call ministry or whether it's a, 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 a parent at home, you know, a, a mom at home taking care of her kids or whatever it is, realize that God's placed us with a purpose and to walk with Him faithfully where He's called us and He has people that He wants to reach through us that may not be reached by somebody else. Like He has us there for that purpose and you even saw that um, there with the running. And I also appreciate too is I think what this brings out is just the importance too of us as believers living our lives in light of eternity and just that we would live with eternity's values in view that we would realize you know I, I um, the the famous British preacher Leonard Ravenhill um, is, is buried in Lindale Texas and um, one of the things that he has etched on his his gravestone is something he said when he was alive and it was a question he asked and he said are the things you're living for worth Christ dying for and I think that's a really good question for us to ask, even as we consider running the distance in our Christian life, of like, are we taking this temporary life we've been given and investing in the things that will count for eternity? Um, and having that mindset of that we were not made for our pleasure primarily, we were made for his pleasure and to live our lives, to run the race of our Christian life set before us in light of that is, is huge. Um, I think as we just consider um, what God's called us to as believers. I would like to... Um, just consider a little bit, um, before we wrap this episode up, I'd like us to just spend a little bit of time unpacking because one of the things is I started kind of running more, not running by any means the level that you're at, but running more and found that, that I enjoyed it. Um, one well, maybe, of maybe we should clarify what running a little bit is for you because you just ran your furthest distance ever, if, I, if that's... If if, if that's correct, which was 31 miles. Yes, just 31 miles, a third of your 100 <laughs> just, <round. laughs> just 30. <laughs> but in running, I just, what I found was, is as I started running more, that I just saw there were so many, as I'd read in the scriptures, different times. It's amazing how many different times the scripture uses the idea of running or the race set before us in, um, in the scripture. And obviously one of the clearest places that it does is in Hebrews um, chapter 12, probably the most familiar place. There's other places, but probably the most familiar place is there in Hebrews 12. Um, and in verse one, it says, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
let us sit, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds. And there's a lot in that passage. There's a lot of good preaching in there. Um, but I, I, you know, one of the things it says here right at the beginning when it's gi- giving this analogy of the race set before us in the Christian life, it talks about laying aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us. And I think it's easy for us to see the need to set aside sin. You know, we know that that. But then what is this idea of weight? And I think part of it is the things that may not necessarily be sinful in and of themselves, but they may be just leading something God's leading you to set aside um, to run the race that is set before you. And I remember you sharing an analogy related to this because when you run, um, do you bring your phone with you and do you listen to stuff when you run? And if not, why? And explain how that might be an analogy here. Yeah, so under most circumstances, no, I don't take my phone with me. Um, There are a few races that require it just for safety reasons because some of these remote places are not, yeah, it's just not safe to be out there without communication. Um, But yeah, typically I don't run with my phone And the reason why, I I remember my dad asking me once, like, Arlen, why don't you take your phone with with you? Mm -hmm. Like, wouldn't that be handy? And I just simply said, Dad, it's extra weight. Mm -hmm. And my dad said, well, how much is it? And when he said that, I thought for a minute. And he said, Arlen, is there some way you could figure out how much weight, the accumulative weight of a cell phone would be over the duration of 100 miles. And I'm like, I'm thinking, how in the world are we going to come up with a number to give people perspective? Because 100 miles is like something you drive. It's not something you run. <laughs> right. Okay. So so to, to bring it in perspective, it all of a sudden, this light bulb went on. Yes, we can do this. Because my Garmin watch counts my steps. So I remember looking back through some data in, the, in my last my last race, and it was like I took 158,000 steps during that race. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, this is pretty simple, actually. So I thought to myself, well, every time I take a step, that phone would be lifted, right? Every every pound that I have with me is lifted. Mm-hmm. So we did the we did the calculations, and we figured up it was about 70,000 pounds of accumulative wow. weight over that hundred miles and that of course is exactly what the scripture is talking about i think you know and then i and then i told people the analogy of like western states when i got a podium position what i didn't tell you i got a podium but by 17 seconds so there was another runner 17 seconds behind when i entered the track that day and when he saw that he couldn't catch me he then walked the 300 meters around the track. But I was, I was 17 seconds away from losing the podium position, which, you know. Is that, it's huge. A string of events that, you know, landed me a professional career in athletics. But that was one of those pivotal moments. And when you think about a 70,000-pound logging truck, you know, a loaded logging truck compared to, like, that precious 17 seconds Mm -hmm. like that's that's the perfect example of a you know a a life defining you know a defining moment in my life Mm -hmm. that could have been derailed Mm -hmm. by a simple decision to take that little bit of extra weight but in our our walk with god how like these little things that we excuse or think it's not a big deal that we allow in our lives that might just be that little bit of weight Mm -hmm. that satan wants to keep us from you know, fulfilling God's full purpose for our life. Yeah, that's so profound, and I think so important because it's like those little compromises can, like, I think it's in those little daily choices that can be defining moments for us spiritually. We don't realize it because it's just, it just seems like it's a small thing, but whether it's a sin or whether it's just a weight, it's something that God's leading us to set aside. Maybe it's something that's become too important in our life or whatever, and God leads us to set it aside. Even you talked about social media, like, there's nothing wrong with social media in and of itself. It can even be a tool that can you can share truth on, but God was leading you to set it aside lest it become a weight, right? And so it's like, and I feel like, or and it could, for someone else, it could be something else. There can be different weights, things that can distract us or derail us in our walk with the Lord. And I think that what I think is so important is that what I think we need to cultivate 
is what you're saying is we need to have the mindset of an athlete when it comes to our Christian life. Um, and I, I think this is so important, like that we have an athlete mindset when we approach, because Paul, this is, way, like, this is very biblical. Okay, this is what Paul said we're supposed to approach, I mean, the Holy Spirit through Paul, so we're supposed to approach the Christian life, right? Even in uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 25, um, you know, he's even talking about using this, this picture of, of, of running a race, actually. Um, and it's another place in Scripture where the idea of a race is used, and I love what it says here. It says, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to attain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So he's like, okay, you have the athlete mindset, but it's almost times 100 because you're not doing it to obtain just a podium finish at a big race. You're running the race of the Christian life to hear those precious words from our Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Your eyes are, our eyes are fixed on that, and we live our lives in light of that. And it says he that strives for mastery, right? He that strives to run well in his Christian life is temperate in all things. And the mindset of the athlete is, here's what I would say. I hear a lot of people, I think, ask this kind of qu a question like this related to some issue in that. They say, well, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with this kind of this? Or what's this kind of wrong with this kind of that? You know, what's wrong with that movie? What's wrong with this music? Or what's wrong with this? What's wrong with... And that's actually the wrong question. We shouldn't be asking what's wrong with it, right? Because if we're asking what's wrong with it, usually there's already a, oh, well, what can I get away with and still be okay? That's the wrong question. The question is not what's wrong with it. Better question, the mindset of an athlete way to ask the question is, what's right with it? Will it propel me forward? It's not just, oh, what's wrong with it? It's what's right with it and it, it could be a weight or a hindrance i set it aside because i'm running with patience the race set before me looking into jesus the author and finisher of my faith so the mindset of an athlete is that like we're we're centered on christ and we're every part of our life is being brought into alignment with that um and people may say you run 100 miles you know without your phone without listening to anything like isn't that so difficult but you're like yes but but the reason you don't is because it would slow you down you know that's the mindset of an athlete um, if I'm just trying to run just to finish 100 miles, you know, I'm just going to kind of listen to my phone and, you know, beating snacks and doing all everything and resting or whatever. But if I'm running to win, then it's like, I don't bring my phone because I, I want to win. You know, and that's the mindset we should have, spiritually speaking. Like, it's like, okay, someone may say, what's wrong with that? Well, it's like, well, I, 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 it, I'm, I'm, I'm running to win. You know, we're running, we're, we're seeking to run well in our Christian life. And so that's why we set some of those things aside um, because we have that vision. And then that's what it says, right? That's right what it goes into Hebrews 12 after it talks about laying aside every weight and sin. It says looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Um, what are some of the things that can help us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, spiritually speaking? Um, what, what, what are, what, unpack that a little bit of how do we, spiritually speaking, running the race of our Christian life, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus? Yeah, I think when you look at, at Paul's analogy, you know, saying to look unto unto Christ, the, the, the finisher of our faith, you know, when we think about mm -hmm. hearing those words, well done, because... As that, as that relates to my world of running, there is a lot of running out there that is not fun. Like, I do enjoy huge portions of it. Okay, there are like, it's probably to the point where I enjoy like 80% of the 100 miles that I run. And when I started, it was probably like 20%. Okay, there is enjoyment along the way. But when we really keep our eyes on the finish line, that's the only way we can get through what we're going through in the day to day. Because I really feel like if you do have a heart that is fully surrendered to God, he's going to call you to suffer. Mm -hmm. And as we go through that suffering, if we think about, you know, just what's happening now, rather than having an eternal perspective, we're going to get bogged down and be like, well, this isn't worth it. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my, you know, my friends that aren't serving God have it much easier than me. What's mm -hmm. the point? Well, that isn't the point, because like you said, having a, an eternal perspective, I think that it relates. I, th I think, you know, in the world of running, it gives us, it's a way of like living. It's been said that running 100 miles is like living a life in a day, because in so many ways, it does feel like you lived a whole lifetime in that one day. And it gives you this perspective that, okay, I am looking mm -hmm. to the finish line, mm -hmm. and I'm going to live a whole life in this one day, okay? Yeah. And yet, how much, I think that's why Paul was likening that to our walk with God, because we have to live our life not for, not for what we're experiencing now, not mm -hmm. for what we're going to experience tomorrow, maybe not what we're going to experience 10 years from now, but what's really going to count mm -hmm. in eternity. Mm -hmm. And that's something that my dad really, really emphasized in my, you know, growing up years. He always was willing to set aside those things that were 
temporal, those things that were not going to last for eternity. And he would always remind us that we're going to do, we're going to do things that last for eternity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that sort of mindset, then applying that to the running world. And then once you experience this for yourself, once I experienced this, all of this, you know, this whole, you know, tackling things that before looked completely impossible you know when you really have your eyes fixed on that finish line and you believe that it's going to be worth it i think there there have been so many events where i was competing and you know i've run over 20 of these 100 mile events and you know praise the lord to this day i have not yet had a dnf but you know which stands for did not finish Mm -hmm. But there were so many events that I was so tempted to quit. I was so close. There were so many Mm -hmm. times I was so close. And what will blow your mind is those were some of the events that I ended up winning the race, like coming in first place, were the events that I was thinking about quitting, like earlier in the race. Mm -hmm. And after you've been through a few of those, and then when you look at life, it really helps you to appreciate suffering Mm -hmm. and to to be willing to endure suffering because it gives you that more of that like eternal perspective while we understand you know where where i get to experience this in a certain event a certain day or a couple days we as as believers need to look at that take that same mindset into the into the walk of faith as paul is saying and, and like look at the finish line look look at just think about you know hearing jesus say at the end well done thou good and faithful servant and when you hear that you yeah. will be glad because i've never been at a finish line and had I, I mean i've heard people say all kinds of stuff when they come through the finish line but no one's ever said boy i wish i would have just quitted back there at 60 right. i've never heard i wish i would have quit mm-hmm. like that i that's never been said at the finish mm-hmm. line and that segues perfectly into um what I was thinking kind of as a closing thought here in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, after talking about running the race that is set for us, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, it says, you know, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. And I think most people think that the racing analogy ends in verse 2, but I really think verse 3 is connected there as well, um, because it says, for consider him, speaking of Christ, who endured. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. And, you know, I think that that's so powerful because really if we want to run the distance in our Christian life, one of the keys is keeping our minds and hearts stayed on Christ, centering our mind on his word. Scripture says in Romans 8, the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And, you know, really with running, your mind is going to faint before your body does. And if your mind faints, then your body will too. (laughs) Um, But I think, and I think so often, and I know you shared with me at different times just how often, like, so much of running is like yes of course there's huge physical aspects too but so much of it is overcoming those mental roadblocks you know so much of the battle of the mind you know of what we'll set our mind on um and because of and because we even talked about some of those walls and different things that you can hit in your mind and if you and 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 how then your body will fail too even though your body could keep going (laughs) um physically you it has the strength to do that god has given the strength to do that and i think in in our christian life it's the same way where it's like the first, you know, scripture talks about gird up the loins of your mind, you know, and just the importance of, of, in other words, prepare your mind for battle, prepare it for action, you know, and just the importance of filling our mind and heart with the word of God and and keeping our eyes stayed on Christ helps us run the distance in our Christian life um, in a way that is just so, I think, important and vital for our lives as believers. As we close out here, um, you know, we talk about this kind of endurance. Uh, I I referenced earlier uh, that, that, that you know, I thought 100 miles about as far as a person could go, probably, but I, you actually did something a little further. So I want to I want to close this out um, with you sharing two things. One is share us your most recent um, ad- running adventure, um, and then um, which which went beyond 100 miles, which sounds impossible, <laughs> and it went way beyond 100 miles. But I'm gonna let you give give the the details there, and then I just want you to to give a, a, any closing thought you would have, maybe maybe to even a young person. That, what I was thinking here is what. As you've now been down the track some, you know, if you were to look back and think of what advice or encouragement would you give yourself at 14? You know, in other words, if there's if there's even a young person listening and they're like, how do I live for Christ? You know, we see our culture running the opposite direction of God and of his word and all the pressure to cave. And yet there's a young person maybe listening 
um, or even a, or even a parent or somebody listening that's struggling with that pressure that they're experiencing at work or at home or at school, and they're like, how do I run well? How do I not cave to the pressure? How do I endure even the suffering of being misunderstood or, or different things that they're going to face and run well the Christian life? So share with us your most recent race, and then bring and then and then give us a closing thought on how that applies to our lives as believers to run well in the distance. Yeah. So my most recent race. Uh, was in Arizona back in in May, so it would have been about six or seven weeks ago, and uh, it was yeah, it was 250 miles, um, a point to point race in in Arizona, central Arizona, and it, of course you cannot string together 250 miles of buttery trail. Okay, this had like up over the mountains through the desert, like the most extreme conditions you could possibly find in terms of like weather conditions you know being freezing cold at night and then like mid 80s in the day um like all the adversity that you know comes with just the chorus and then to string together 250 miles of this and i'm sure i'm sure you know now people are wondering like how long does this take (laughs) you know like we kind of hinted about how long it takes to run 100 miles um so i finished in like 61 hours and 40 something minutes so it would have been like basically um it would have been basically like three days two nights um so yeah i on you know after doing like so many 100 mile events i was very eager to see like what happens it's been so long since i've been like what happens when i go that far so i got to experience that all over again you know years after competing in my first 100 mile race um, but it was it was amazing all of the all of the new mental struggles like all of the new challenges but the one thing that it really stood out to me about running 200 miles one thing that that scared me was going into it I knew that at the end of 100 miles my body always just like shuts down whenever I stop I get shivers my body temperature is very unstable it's just like I basically just need to be like you know drugged to a warm bed and like covered up and like sleep it off okay and I wasn't sure when I went into this 250 mile race how in the world I was going to go through multiple days and multiple nights and like it's kind of pretty well understood that if you want to do well you have to figure out how to sleep and when I mean sleep like we're talking like a 30 minute nap that's like will change the whole change your whole perspective but you it, but I I was very nervous about how this was going to play out like how do you sleep for just 30 minutes a night and so I went into it and I was like okay we're just going to see how this works like I, I think this is how it's going to work but I might get to n- the middle of the night I might try to sleep I might not be able to sleep I might wake up and be freezing cold and unable to hold my body temperature and like I wasn't sure how this was going to work but when I got done I realized it worked and do you know why it worked like why doesn't it work when you run 100 miles but it does when you run 250 and what I learned is it's so much about mindset because you know what happened when I finished that 250 miles immediately my body shut down and like I got the shivers again I needed to be wrapped in a blanket like all of the things that happened at the end of 100 miles they didn't happen 100 miles into my race they happened at the finish line and I think that's the important lesson that I learned from that is how much we need to have a a, you know a finish line mindset as Mm -hmm. we go through life because we have to keep our eyes on that finish line because as soon as we think you know I thought you know a hundred miles was was the most absurd thing that anyone would ever need to do but yet it was by going way beyond that that I learned that my mind was just playing games with me when I reached 100 miles like I thought that that was just a really cool number so I quit there right but when you go beyond that and I think as we as we apply this to our own life we have to realize that there's so many times along the way where Satan will try to tempt us to say you know I've I've had I've had it this is enough like this was more than I signed up for okay like my mom feels bad for me she prays when I'm out running and finally I told my mom I said mom you don't need to feel sorry for someone's self-inflicted pain like I signed up for this (laughs) but you know in in life there are many things that we maybe didn't sign up for Mm -hmm. but but God has asked us to endure Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the midst of it, it may look like this is never going to end. Like, this is, like, I can't do this. But, you know, I didn't know how I was going to run for multiple days and multiple nights without my body shutting down. But I found out when I had in my mind made up that this is what I was going to do. Then it unlocked potential that I never knew was there. And I think as we follow Christ, if we have the mindset that we're going to do this much for God, that's how much we're going to do for God. Mm -hmm. But if we have a a, a mindset that I'm going to do whatever God asks me to do, then we've already made up in our mind that wherever God takes us, we will follow. And I think that's the mindset that we have to take into walking with God is that we're following God on his terms, not our terms. Because when we're following it on our terms, we're going to quit when we think we're done. Mm -hmm. But guess what? God never gave us that privilege to quit when we're done. Mm-hmm. We were our two endure to the end. Yes, amen. And I can't think of a better way to wrap this up because that really is that that willingness to go to the Lord and be like, okay, Lord, through the power of your spirit, I'm willing to do whatever it takes um, for you and for your kingdom um, to run well. And one of the things I was thinking of as we um, as we close out here was just that, you know, I appreciate what you brought out too of running with the end in sight. And one thing I've been thinking about a decent amount recently is just the important of if we as believers can consider the end of the because I, I hear about a lot of people when they come to the end of their life Christians having regrets um, oh I wish I hadn't you know I, and usually the regrets are related to they spent more time in the temporal and not as much time investing in the eternal and you know nobody at the end of their life was like oh I wish I'd watched more movies or I wish I had done more social media I wish I had you know uh, caught more fish or whatever like that's never what it is at the end of their life it's always regret for not living their life in light more of the eternal and I feel like, but one of the things that that's really impressed on my heart, and I feel like God's really impressed on my heart is, what if we could step back and say, okay, I want to live with the end in sight so I can live my life without regret at the end. You know, where it's like we're investing in the eternal. Even James would say, what is your life? It is but a vapor that is here, and it has gone so quickly. And so if we can, if we can keep our eyes fixed on eternity, on the finish line, if you want to put it that way, then we can, it, we're going to chart our course now to run like William Borman, Borden is said to the, the man who died as a, as a young missionary heading out to the mission field um, and, it, and it's thought that he they found a piece of the story is told that they found a piece of paper and on the paper he'd written no reserves no retreats no regrets and it's like that's what we need to live our lives and our walk with Christ no reserves no retreats and if we live that way we'll have no regrets and so Arlen it's just been a real honor and a privilege to have you on the podcast here thanks so much for joining us and you know I want to thank you too for um for listening today to this episode and I just want to encourage you you know as we saw from Hebrews 12 to run the distance in our Christian life the key is keeping our eyes the gaze of our soul fixed on Jesus considering him keeping our mind and heart centered on his word filling our mind and heart with his word and looking unto him. So I want to encourage you, as you run the race set before you, as we run the race set before us, let us keep the gaze of our soul fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ and look to him to enable us to run well the race set before us and to live our lives in light of eternity, to live for those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, and to live our lives in such a way that God would get all the glory because he would have done in and through us what we could never do on our own. So we trust that he'll do that and we look forward to you joining us next week for our next episode. God bless you.